broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's uh, Let's Grow webinar, sponsored by the American Sheep Industry Association. My name is Jay Parsons, and I'll be your host this evening. And uh, it's my pleasure to have with me Debbie Webster this evening, who will be speaking on how to start a farm on limited acreage. I'd like to start by thanking the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association for providing the funding for this educational webinar and encourage you to visit the ASI website to learn more about the sheep business and how to be successful uh, being a sheep entrepreneur. Their website is www.sheepusa.org. And if you go on the home page up at the top menu, you'll see a link for resources and that's where you'll find the Let's Grow resources and uh, uh, among the things that are there are the recordings for all of these Let's Grow ed educational web webinars along with a lot of other uh, materials uh, that are very informative and, and there to help you be successful in the sheep business. I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded and all of the webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a direct link to the webinar recording as well as a link to the webinar slides. Uh, you'll also be able to access on the Let's Grow website those uh, webinar recordings, as I already mentioned. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be a little bit different webinar in that uh, we have an actual producer on here with us, and we're going to make it a little more conversational as she goes through her materials. So uh, um, as she uh, speaks on each slide, I encourage you, if you have a question on what she's talking about, to go ahead and, and type that question into the question box. Or if you'd like to speak to her directly to ask that question, you can raise your hand. Of course, in order to do that, you have to have a microphone connected to your computer um, and be willing to have your name called out on the air if I call on you to actually ask your question. So our plan is for uh, Debbie to work her way through our slides and we'll entertain uh, you know, anywhere from three to five questions per slide if we have them. If not, we'll just keep moving right along. And then we'll have our regular Q&A session time at the end. But we thought it might work a little better this way because she's got a lot of, a lot of neat things to show you and, and might generate some thoughts uh, that you want to um, pounce on at the time that she's talking about them uh, so that she can address those while the pictures are up there and so on. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our speaker, which is Debbie Webster. She's a small farm entrepreneur and educator uh, from Seneca, South Carolina. She's coming to us um, from her home tonight. So uh, we uh, really uh, thank her for taking the time to do this this evening. Um, her farm is called the Whispering, Whispering Pines Farm. And she's also started a nonprofit called the Whispering Pines Foundation that's dedicated to, to getting children and youth outdoors involved in dairy, sheep, and farming. So she's very passionate about helping people start farms, and that's uh, what brings her here this evening that, that she wants to share with us. She started the first 4-H dairy, dairy sheep club in the U.S. Her agritourism program served over 1,000 families last summer. She has classes for small ruminant care, cheese making, and uses her sheep for therapy for children with special needs. Uh, today, she uh, <coughs> has the only licensed sheep milk dairy in South Carolina. And her cheese business uh, continues to grow tremendously each year. She also has a meat handler's license and sells pastured lamb. So she's got a full uh, gamut of experience there to share with you this evening. So um, in a conversation with Debbie uh, preparing for this webinar, she uh, mentioned that she probably uh, in the last 10 years has helped about 25 sheep producers get started across at least five different states. Um, so she's not just uh, talking about it tonight, but she's actually experienced uh, helping people start a farm. So Debbie, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the microphone over to you and, uh, and we'll just continue forward with our plan and looking forward to uh, your remarks and your slides. Okay, well, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. We do this, how to start a family farm uh, here in South Carolina, and the class is usually four hours, and uh, we just go over everything. And one thing that people usually start with is chickens and getting their own eggs and that kind of thing. But just because this is through ASI, we're talking mostly about sheep. And we're also going to talk about goats because a lot of people uh, – do both and or some people do goats and maybe are curious about sheep so um, the first thing if you're going to start a small farm why are you doing it are you doing it to feed your family are you doing it to have something to do maybe some supplemental income when you're retired or um, some people want to have sheep uh, out there just to 
eat on keep their their lawns mowed or whatever and uh, there's uh, I think there's as many different reasons that people start I find that mostly young families want to do it and usually uh, it's for two reasons the life lessons that kids can learn just working around a farm are just wonderful they, they can be outside they can be responsible um, you know just physically working around the farm I think it's very very good and very positive. Uh, not that we want our kids to grow up to be laborers, but there's a lot of brain activity that increases from physical activity. There's a lot of uh, figuring things out, how to make things better, how to make things faster. I think it helps kids be uh, a little more uh, intuitive with the animals. Also, uh, whether you agree or not, all animals have their own different personalities. And we've done a lot of therapy with kids that can't seem to communicate or socialize with others, whether they're on the autistic spectrum or whether they've had uh, some kind of emotional problems. And when they learn to work with animals on a, and the animals aren't talking to them, but they're learning on a nonverbal level about personalities, it really helps them to bond. And they gravitate oftentimes towards the one that has the same personality as they do. And it's kind of interesting how that all works out. When you have uh, children that learn how to, where their food comes from and how to raise animals, they just seem to have a better outlook on, on life. Uh, we do farm tours all the time and uh, can show a, a wheelbarrow of feed and there's oats, corn, maybe barley, maybe pellets in the wheelbarrow. And I'll ask the kids, to pick out a corn kernel and they usually can and i'll ask them where does corn come from and it takes a long time before they figure out that this came out of the ground and not out of the can and uh the other thing when i show them an oat and it's hard for them to figure that out i ask them where oats come from and the number one answer is an oak tree <laughs> and so we've got a long way to go with some of the kids that uh, don't grow their own gardens or they aren't around the farm and I think that we're getting more and more removed from farm life and animals. And I think it'd be great even if you can do it on on one acre of land and just get a handful of animals to show the kids more about animals. Um, the picture here on the lower left, uh, we sold a couple of bottle baby lambs to a family and they have just had the best time with those babies. We've sold a lot of uh, bottle babies to families that just wanted to have their kids experience it. And they, uh, I had one lady call me and she said, you know, Debbie, I just can't wean this baby. And it's like a year old. And I said, well, that's your fault, not the baby's, because of course they're going to cry. She said, well, I can't, I can't stop feeding the bottle. It cries too much. And I thought, well, you know, you've got to stop sometime. So it's, uh, it can be challenging in a lot of different ways. And uh, this is one of the kids from the 4-H club. We do the 4-H club for kids five years of age and up. And this is one of the shows that we had here on the, on your on the right hand side with all the kids and we did it sort of like the the dairy goats where they would dress in white and uh, and those kids just had the best time and there's 4-H for meat sheep but not for dairy sheep and they've they've asked me to write the book for um, the project book because we did it in Greenville County South Carolina which maybe half of you don't know what that means but it's um, it's not as rural as it used to be in fact the farm that we were in until just this past January of 20 acres is completely surrounded by houses. We're basically in a neighborhood. And um, these kids, we had to make the projects for kids that really had no opportunity to keep an animal at home. They just kept them, you know, uh, we had different programs where they could do a uh, foster care for a lamb for the first week of life. And they had to learn everything about it. And we had kids out in the pasture doing the lamb watch. And I had kids that, uh, young, young kids, and we'd put gloves on, and they could feel inside of you if that baby wasn't presented right, and it was the coolest thing to watch kids do that. We did uh, stuff with wool, and we did, uh, didn't do too much with meat, kind of meat sales went way down with the 4-H club, but um, we're fixing to start in a, uh, do three counties in the in our new location. This uh, center picture at the bottom is a little girl. We, we were asked to come to the Shriners Hospital and had kids with, um, with problem with limbs or amputees and this little girl doesn't her fingers are not separated and she just loved the sensory input on the on that little lamb so there's a lot of different reasons why you can do it and uh, and that's kind of your own thing i when i teach this class oftentimes um everyone wants to go commercial and so uh we'll talk about about that 
So when you decide, is it going to be for memories or for money? And if you start small, you can spend less, leave room for growth. And the thing about sheep and goats, they'll they'll have twins, triplets, and your your flock size can grow pretty pretty quickly. It gives you time when you start small to get a little more experienced and, and learn what to do as you go. Uh, if it's more labor intensive, uh, less upfront costs, and we'll go over the different things that can make it more or less uh, labor intensive. And if you have kids, maybe you want it to be a little more labor intensive where they have to kind of do things instead of pushing a button, they're toting a bucket of feed and, and walking around. So uh, there's positives and all that. Uh, if you if you have all this uh, upfront money, you're thinking, well, how am I going to return on my investment? Uh, this picture, this first picture here on the left, this little lamb, uh, when the lambs are born in the spring, if you have them at the right size, uh, when Easter comes up, and Easter is not always on the same date, it changes a little bit from sometime in March to almost, you know, the end of April or May. We had the the people um, rent the lambs for photo shoots for Easter pictures, and it, they dress them up or they just hold them, and and uh, they had the best time doing that. And so on one lamb, you know, we could feed that lamb and and make more money than we could when we sell them on the hoof just from fifty dollars an hour for a photo shoot. And you'd be surprised how many people would do it. Um, and then just pictures that are funny for Facebook, you get a lot of traction off of that. And then with the wool stuff, you're going to usually shear them right before they lamb. And so you'll have wool products that you can work with. And we'll talk more about the wool products later. And then there's, uh, we had that adopt a lamb program where the kids had to buy the, the formula, the milk replacer to feed the orphan lambs and, um, and have a crate to keep them at home and that kind of thing. So that actually worked out pretty good for us. It was a win-win because the kids loved it and the parents were happy about it. And then the kids would have to bring them back uh, when they got too big to be in the house or in the yard or whatever. And uh, But they had a really good experience with that. Some things to think about. What do you want to harvest? What do you want to use? Multi-breed, uh, multi-use breeds. Uh, there's some sheep that Besides the fiber, they have good fiber. They, they, if if you do dairy, you're still going to do meat because you have to breed the animal before it comes into milk. And a lot of people don't realize that, but that's how it works. And then you'll have babies to sell, or or you'll harvest meat later, um, or you can sell people future breeding stock. Uh, your location. Do you have a predator problem? That means you're going to have to get some livestock guardian dogs, or make sure your fences are sound. Um, how are your neighbors? Are they going to have a problem with it or are they going to welcome it? Or they, do they have a lot of dogs or, or some issues there? Resources, you know, you got to figure it's going to take time. It's going to take more time to do anything with dairy because it's a it's an everyday thing. Not that you're not taking care of a, a, a meat animal or a fiber animal, but uh, it, it'll take some dedicated time. Uh, how, what are the, count the costs? Uh, do you have mentors nearby that can help you? These should be really helpful things. Your acreage. You could take six to eight sheep or goats uh, on one acre of land, but if it's not good forage and you haven't done soil tests to see if your soil's healthy, if you don't try to overseed it, um, are you going to have enough room to rotate them? Uh, that's kind of a general statement six to eight and in some it would be great but what if it's a forest you know it's not going to support them so you want to try to rotate them you want to try to have one sacrificial pasture when you can't rotate them or if you're in a drought um you want to have an isolation area if, if somebody gets sick and, uh, and it can happen you got to think about biosecurity uh, biosecurity is not just other animals. It can be visitors from other farms that maybe they have issues on their farm and they can walk right through your farm and bring some kind of contaminants in. What about uh, bringing in new breeding stock if you need a new male to help grow your herd? Uh, if you decide not to grow, you can certainly keep a, a closed herd and you keep the same breeding stock and just sell the offspring. So that's one way to do it. And then however long they're, they're able, that's what you can do. So talking about dairy, um, I wanted to show you the udders of a dairy sheep because um, we've had meat sheep, hair sheep, and we tend to think that the wool sheep uh, breeds with the East Frisians have a, a, better, um, a better udder. You've got some good definition there. You've got a long enough teat. 
you probably want to be able to get a, an animal with a long enough teeth where you can hand milk. And I showed a picture of the orifice. That's something you can look at. There's some of them. You couldn't hardly drive a finishing nail in that orifice. Not that you would, but I'm talking about how small the diameter is. You want it big enough so you can get a good flow because it's going to be easier for you and easier for the animal to milk them out. These have the inflations on, but you might be hand milking if you only have a couple of them. I think most people will tell you if you're, if you don't, if you're not getting that much milk out of them, then maybe just hand milk them. And if you're just doing it for home use, I've seen just about everything. Beware of the contraptions that they sell that people have homemade because it may really injure your animal. So be cautious about some of those devices that probably aren't something that most people would use. I think it's good for you to learn how to hand milk because um, you kind of get a feel for it and then you can figure out what it's supposed to feel like. The um, one way to learn how to milk without abusing the animal is if you just fill up like a latex glove with water and if you'll reach around the top and do kind of like a first finger, the next finger, the next finger, kind of accordion, push it out. You'll see when you're doing it wrong, it'll push back up into the hand of the glove and not down into the fingers. So there is a, there's a knack to it. I remember one time I sold a lady, a, a real nice ewe, and she had milked other animals before. And so I felt like she could do it. And she called me back and she said, I'm having a real problem with this ewe. She's, she just keeps filling up and I can't milk her out. And I said, well, I've had complaints before, but never that the, the sheep had too much milk to suit you. So you've got to get that hand strength up because it will wear you out. Just that continual repetitive motion trying to, to milk them out. And uh, milking machines are available. Uh, there's different qualities. The problem with the, the, the mobile units that you can move around is, um, a lot of times the vacuum isn't strong enough, so if they kick it off or it comes off of them, it takes a while for it to pump back up to be able to, to do it efficiently. Also, that the pulsation rate is going to be different for sheep and goats. And uh, goats and cows are anywhere from 60 to 90 beats per minute, where the sheep are going to be a lot higher, more like 120. So, And you've got some people that are going to tell you that they use the same thing on both, but um, I think long term it's not going to be as good. Uh, if people are getting started with uh, dairy, there's so many products that you can make that you would really enjoy. And um, a lot of people I hear don't even know that sheep can be dairy animals. And that just makes me crazy because they keep calling my my cheese goat cheese and it's actually sheep milk cheese. Uh, the difference is we have goats and sheep and we milk them both and, and make products out of them. And one of the differences is uh, when you take a gallon of goat milk or cow's milk, you make cheese, you're going to get about a pound of cheese. When you do sheep milk, you're going to get at least two pounds. I've had during certain seasons where they're, they're a little creamier in their milk or whatever they're eating in the pasture or whatever, that I'll have up to three pounds out of one gallon. So it's, it's an amazing product. And we make yogurt and kefir and cheese and uh, I put soap down here at the bottom. A lot of people that uh, don't have a lot uh, will make make uh, soap, and you can sell that without a license. To be able to sell your, your milk, it's different in every state, and I know that there's people out west and everywhere else, and I don't know all the rules. I just know the rules for South Carolina, and South Carolina gives you a, a permit, to, a license to sell uh, grade A raw milk, and a lot of states won't do that, and there's some uh, states that issue pet milk licenses and uh, for cheese making if it's a cheese that's less than 60 days old or aged then it has to be pasteurized milk where if you have something that you're going to age longer than 60 days then you can use raw milk now if you're making it for home use you can uh, if you're using it for home use you can you can do it raw or whatever you want to do that's totally up to you but if you're going to sell it to the public and eventually you might um, that's that's part of the rules So wool products. Now, I think a lot of people worry about um, how are they going to shear, but, uh, you know, we found a lot of uses for the wool. And, you know, when I had 10 sheep, I sheared them myself. And a lot of people will say, well, you can't hardly do that. Well, you can. It takes a whole lot longer. I want to tell you these professional shearers that can do one, it seems like in a couple of minutes and it takes me like an hour per sheep. But it was fun because the kids got to learn how to do it. I'm, I, my kids both know how to shear sheep, and it's, it's not that big a deal. I had one lady that I sold some sheep to, and 
they were uh, Icelandics and they have such a, a huge fleece that they really ought to be sheared twice a year. And she, I think she had like children's scissors and she was out there and she did it in a lot of segments and that's probably not recommended, but um, you can get the wool off and you can use it for a lot of different things. We, with our 4-H club, uh, you can make a drop spindle with uh, just stuff at the Hobby Lobby and the kids were able to make their own yarn and bracelets and braid it and have a big time with it. We did the uh, this uh, felting. Uh, we dyed the, the wool in Kool-Aid and made all kinds of amazing things and the kids had the best time. When the shearer came, the kids would, uh, from the 4-H club, would help skirt the wool. So in other words, when it comes off the sheep, they'll put it on something and shake off any of the fibers and then snip off the part that's not wanted. And we would bag that stuff up and sell it for plant toppers because wool, you can actually use it as a mulch around your 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 vegetables or your bushes or whatever. And when it rains, it'll hold that moisture to keep moisture around that plant. It doesn't go away. It stays there for a long time. And the fiber and the the manure will help fertilize it as it rains. So it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And we, we made um, yarn and, and people uh, knitted shawls out of them. We took some of it and had it organically processed and had these beautiful uh, blankets made. And when you process, you'll have a hide left over. And these are great rugs. And there's just a really a lot of neat things that we can do with, um, with the wool. You, you know, we stuffed pillows with them. That was super easy. And they had like Christmas sheep and just fun things. And I went to CVS, it's a pharmacy around here. And I noticed that they had these little baggies of maybe two ounces of wool and they were selling them for people that dance or needed inserts for like $7 and 99 cents. And I'll put little two and three and four pound packs of, uh, of it and, and people will buy it like crazy and kids just like to feel it and play with it. There's some um, crafters that want these uh, wool pieces to put on beards on Santa Clauses. There's just a bunch of uses and, and you don't have to have any kind of licensing and you would be amazed at how many people would would want the wool. In fact, we could sell a virgin wool for $15 a pound and then virgin wool is, is wool that's the first time that that sheep is sheared. And then every time after that, it's it's not virgin anymore. So that's if you've heard wood, virgin wool, that's where that comes from, and uh, and it would it would be ten dollars a pound if it wasn't virgin wool. And you know, it's it's all about who you advertise to. There's spinners and knitters and clubs and probably every town in America that if they knew that you had the wool, they'd probably be ready to look at it. And you may just want your kids to learn how to work the wool. And there's a lot of things you could just do a, a felted thing and make little pocketbooks and little wallets. So there's there's a lot of things you can do with the wool. In fact, I think there's a hey, Debbie? something on uh, ASI that uh, just did something about wool. Debbie, we do have a question on the wool before you move on. Um, have okay. you done anything with the uh, hides of the sheep? And if so, where, yeah. do you, where do you get them processed? Well, we have a, a guy that's uh, in our town that does it. And and he doesn't charge that much. And so it's it's worth it to me to take it. But there, you can go to any hunting supply and they'll show you how to tan hides. And basically what you need is a bunch of salt and you dry it out for the first couple of days. And then after that, you can get it, uh, once it's dried enough and there's no uh, residual meat or flesh on it, uh, it, it becomes more pliable. And then there's certain oils that you put on it after that. So uh, it, I had, uh, Typically, there's there's the white hides that people like because that's what they expect. But I've had some spotted ones and some uh, different colors that I sold for more. So a typical hide, we would sell them. I mean, if you wanted to sell them cheap, $50 is, is cheap. And, and, you know, they have to be, in other words, it has to be a, a good form to it and not a bunch of holes in it. And then uh, I've sold spotted ones for $175. And... Um, and I felt pretty good about that. So you've increased your yield off of one lamb. If you use the, the harvest, the meat for your family, you could sell the hide. And um, and so I think that's a, a pretty good win-win. Okay, thank you. So the meat, now this is all finished. Um, what, what we did initially, uh, we raised, we started with goats and ended up with uh, 
sheep around the same time and we raised uh, goats for pet quality. And when my 25 year old daughter was five years old, she had stomach troubles and someone said, well, goat milk's really good for stomach trouble. So we grabbed the meat goat by the horns, drug it in and milked it. Can I tell you the first time I milked, I had zero, <laughs> zero good responses. I couldn't hardly get the milk out. My kids could actually do better than me. And then of course we figured it out and everybody seemed to like the goat milk. And one thing went from there to another and we had sold just pet goats. And then we started getting more dairy animals. And um, as, as we had babies, um, we noticed that people would buy the, the, the offspring for meat. And I knew that's what they're doing. I knew it was a food group, more so the lambs and the goats, but people would buy the goats as well. And I I really, you could sell them and you could do all right. And the price that you could sell them for is generally anywhere from a dollar a pound to three dollars a pound. And it depends on what the people want and how they're going to use it. And some people want one that's just freshly weaned and it's very small 30 or 35 pounds and they'll put it on a spit and they'll just do it whole and then there's other people that want something bigger and there's a lot of different reasons why people you know if they're doing celebrations or ethnic holidays or whatever it might be and a lot of times i thought well i don't know if they know what they're doing and i was concerned about that and we started learning how to do some processing ourselves and we have a uh, I call them a county extension agent, and Jay told me that that's incorrect now. It's a, it's a local extension educator, but they're here to help you. And we had uh, one of ours that was just wonderful and showed us how to process our own for our own use. And I thought we needed to know how to do that. And, um, and you know, I want to tell you, it was really hard. And um, because, you know, in the beginning, everybody had a name in, uh, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And I think you have to get there. I think you don't start out that way, I, I guess. I mean, it depends on the person, but it was harder for us. And as we started to uh, realize we could sell the meat, we had to get a meat handler's license. And I remember, uh, and then you have to get a label and all that kind of stuff. And every state, I'm sure, is different. There's all kinds of rules. But um, we went to the first place, the first meat processing place. I said, you're going to help me because I really don't know what to do. Oh, yeah, we'll help you. And then they, this particular place, uh, you know, like the, the butcher guy didn't speak English and I didn't know what to do. So I ended up going to Clemson University and, and did a, a meat fabrication class so I could learn what it's supposed to look like and how to do it. And I didn't even know the cuts. And so you have a lot that you need to learn. But I'm going to tell you something that we have now, these are beautiful cuts here. And if you can sell lamb for $15 a pound for ground lamb, and then the rack of lamb and the loin chops are going for $22 a pound. And we're making really cool sausages that have a lot of different flavors. Be, instead of doing a, a $100 for a 100 pound lamb, now you've got a 150 pound lamb that once you pay your processing fees and however much you have in them, raise them, you could top it with about $500 by the time you do it. So, um, it's, I think that, it, well, you know, like we do the, uh, you know, so there's a big thing about broth bones now and we're doing it for $4 a pound and my uh, current processor said, oh yeah, go ahead and, you know, sell that. And I thought, well, that won't sell. And do you know that at the farmer's market, uh, I was selling people packages of bones and they're paying, I mean, there's some big packages. They put like way too much in there, $4 a pound, there's four pounds, it's $16 and they're buying it for their dog. And I'm thrilled and, you know, it's great. And it, and it would have been waste otherwise. The other thing is when you learn to process it yourself, you're going to have at some point, whether you put the animal down yourself or whether something horrible happens and, and you know, the animal has to be put down, you can then use his sacrifice for research about how your farm is doing. We, we learned from learning how to, to do the processing, how to do necropsies. So necropsies is like the animal word for autopsy is for people. So you would look at the, you'd look at the lungs, you look at the heart, you look in the different chambers of the stomach, which is absolutely amazing, by the way. Uh, it's, it's beautiful and cool and uh, it's, it has so many neat functions. Um, I could just go on and on about that, but it's, it's just really neat. But you could learn 
so much about your flock health because they can't tell you. And oftentimes sheep are very stoic and you don't know that something's wrong until, you know, it's too late and you can't hardly get them to recover. And so it's, uh, it, it's that sacrifice can be used in, in a lot of ways. And so that's, uh, I think I would, I would try to get people to do that and it's hard and it seems gruesome and, and it's medical and it's scientific and, um, but I, I think it's, it's something that you could do and eventually should do. So that's, that's just my thought on that. So strategies and schedules, you know, the difference between raising cows, which if you have small acreage, it's hard to raise cows because they're too big and they eat too much. And, you know, it's too much for one person to benefit from. But if you breed in the fall and they have babies five months later in the spring, you could actually process the offspring or harvest it or whatever you want to call it in six to eight months. Everything's done almost in a year's time, where if you're doing cows or cattle rather for beef, going to wait 18 to 24 months, maybe longer if it's grass fed. So I think it's a quick turnaround. And I think people that are, are raising cattle are also getting some sheep and putting them out in the pastures. Uh, I think that lamb is a premium protein. It gives you a little more uh, vitamin and a little more protein. The other thing about lamb meat that you may or may not know is beef like a uh, ribeye is marbled. But lamb, the fat's on the outside. So if you choose not to use the fat, you can just trim it off. And you can't do that with beef. So you can actually make it healthier. If whatever your diet is, uh, you can use it that way. So you breed them in the fall. Most of them are seasonal breeders. However, um, it's different with different breeds. Uh, there's a lot of hair sheep that um, you could, in two years, you could uh, have three uh, births, whether it's a uh, what do you, if you want to call them litters or however you want to call it. Uh, so you can do an accelerated breeding program. You can also, some breeds, like I, we do Tunis, which is a American heritage breed, and they're a meat sheep and they have wool. And it seems to me that they have to be well over a year before they breed. Uh, and we've got our East Frisian dairy sheep that if they're big enough and strong enough, they're two thirds of their growth, very similar to dairy goats. You can uh, breed them when they're six to eight months old. They'll have their their first lambs when they're a year and a half, or you can do the math on that. And uh, and that's that's an accelerated program there. And uh, that's how that works. So weaning varies, um, just like the lactation varies. So it depends on the on the individual. With the weaning, there's a lot of lambs that are fine to wean at 30 days. Lambs grow a whole lot faster than goats. Goats oftentimes, they're weaned at six weeks to four months, and lambs 30 days to 60 days, most of them do it. Now, some people leave their lambs with their moms for four months. Dairy animals oftentimes, uh, the lambs are bottle fed, and they, um, they're weaned at 30 days and, and you just have to look at them and, and kind of get some experience or get someone to help you with that. If they're 35 pounds, they're in pretty good shape for weaning. And if, if they're one of those that's really not thriving, maybe just wait a while. So uh, not everything is, uh, some of those lambs didn't read the book on what time they're supposed to be weaned. So, and the lactation varies. Uh, some are strong milkers and they, start to fade gradually and some are strong till the day you dry them up. We usually, whenever we start milking, we're gonna usually take a break at the end of the season. It works for our family. And you can uh, you can milk them twice a day. Sheep are, are easy. Uh, we've got son and goats that are very heavy milk producers. And typically when, when anybody first gives birth, you know, if you're gonna milk them, you're gonna milk them twice a day. As, as you get tired or your enthusiasm wanes, or if you need to, you can always back off on sheep. Sheep do really well milking once a day, where most goats, it's a lot harder. Um, and, you know, you're going to hear people say, well, you have to milk every 12 hours. Well, you can, but if you want to have a life, in, or if you have somebody that's going to do it for you, uh, we do. I've got friends that do it at 6 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We did it at 7 and four. And what happened is you got a really big uh, amount of milk in the morning and less in the afternoon, but it, it helped everyone finish in a day and it was a lot easier. So 
there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, so we talked about the meat. The thing that makes lamb lamb is if it's a year or younger. And uh, you'll hear a lot of people saying you should always harvest your lamb at six months. Well, sometimes the lamb chops are awful small at six months and maybe they need to be a little bigger. Uh, the lamb doesn't get tough. The other thing, uh, the difference between sheep and goats, if you leave a male intact for, uh, for goats, uh, if they're almost a year old, heck, if they're six months old, they're going to be kind of stinky uh, because of spraying and all that wonderful buck things that uh, goats do. It's not that way with rams. Rams might get in a rut, but they don't get smelly. So um, it doesn't matter if they're intact or not. Um, we, uh, we ban some. I'll tell you, when you're trying to ban little lambs, um, it's real hard. And we could go on about that and probably um, one thing we would do if we're going to ban them is we would put a um, a string uh, at the top of the testicles before we put the band on because they'll slip up and uh, I remember one time I had one of the girls we sold some lambs to and she was going to band her own and I don't think she'd done it before and didn't know about that little string and she had one in and one out and she didn't have anything to snip it. She had to run to Home Depot with this lamb squall and, and had somebody there help her. And so it was like, it's always experiences. Maybe that was one I should have shared, but it was, it was pretty funny actually. And then when you're, do, when you're milking, if you want the babies to nurse, there are some people that don't even milk their ewes until after they wean the babies. Um, we are always going to do a little hands-on with them, whether the babies are nursing or not, we're always going to make sure they're even. Because if she has one lamb, she's going to be uneven and it's going to be hard for her to, to keep that side going without any use. It's a supply and demand thing. So if you're not milking her, she's going to dry up on that side. And if you only milk her occasionally, she's probably going to get mastitis because she doesn't know how to, how to do that on and off stuff. The milk share oftentimes is when the babies are a certain age, they'll put them up and uh, let the moms be separated from them and then milk them out in the morning and then put them back with the lambs during the day. And that works well for a lot of people that way. If you don't feel like milking, you just let the babies have it. But it, it will limit your um, length of time that you can, they just need a schedule that's regular. Anything that's inconsistent is gonna be really hard for that you to continue uh, creating the same amount of milk if it's on again, off again. Wool, usually you shear them before the babies come because if they don't have a whole bunch of wool, they're gonna seek shelter when the weather gets bad. And uh, the lambs, a lot of times, we had a lot of rain this season. I think across the US there was a lot of rain uh, during lambing time and we were calling them aqua lambs because they were out in big puddles and we didn't shear the ewes early enough. It just didn't work this time. and and uh, they didn't worry about it because they didn't care if they were getting rained on, but it was real hard on the lambs. So you want to make sure that they uh, they have good shelter and cover for, for lambing or put them up. Hey, Debbie, and, uh, would, you yes. like, would you like a few questions now? As you... Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Uh, Paige, um, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if it's on this slide or the previous slide because I just now noticed it. But I'm going to unmute you here maybe. I can. Hold on here, Paige. Uh, well, I'll go to some of that typed in. Well, go ahead and, and continue on, I guess. I'll figure out this out. I can't get her unmuted here, so. Okay. okay. Well, she can, she can type it into the chat, into the question box here, if you wouldn't mind, Paige. Um, but we did have some questions come in on the meat side. I know that was your previous okay. slide there, but. Yes. But some people were asking about uh, selling your meat at the farm or at farmer's markets was one of the questions. And are you doing the actual processing yourself or paying somebody else to do it for you? Okay, so in South Carolina, the law is that you, if you want to sell meat even off your farm, uh, you need a meat handler's license. And I don't know what it is in other states. I just know for South Carolina. And also, if you want to sell to the public, you need to have a, a inspected plant uh, taking care of your meat. There's there's a higher level for cross state lines, but you know it has to be one that has a, a inspector there to make sure that the animal is uh, humanely uh, put down and, and then they package it this good. So I do not do this beautiful a job packaging, but um, we sell it at farmer's markets and at the farm store at the, at the farm. And uh, you can sell live animals, um, right off your farm. 
and you can process the meat for yourself for home use. I think there's a lot of homesteaders that if they process their own meat and package it and that kind of thing, I don't see why you couldn't barter with other homesteaders that have other products. I think that's, I think we need to go back to some of those bartering days. Um, but for uh, legally, you have to have the label. This label that's on this meat, you can see where it has the U.S. inspected sticker on it. They stamp the meat. You'll see some of the uh, lamb legs, uh, leg of lamb with a stamp on it. Um, and it has their their number for uh, the processing plant, and it also the so for my label they just put Whisper and Pines and the address and all, and um, so that's what makes it my label. And the first label I did seemed really hard, and then after that the processors they know how to do it and they print it off and they just type your name in there, and uh, that's how that works. Okay, um, so. Paige, the reason I can't unmute you is because you're self-muted. So if you wanted to self, <laughs> if you wanted to unmute yourself, you can talk now. <laughs> Are you there, Paige? Okay. So doesn't sound like it. So Alan, you're the same way. You have your hand up and you're self-muted. If you want to unmute your microphone, you can ask your question now too. Alan, are you there? Yes, I'm trying to there you unmute go. the thing. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, do you uh, shrink wrap all your meat there, or do you uh, wrap it in the paper wraps? You know, initially we did it with the paper rack, but I want to tell you something. This vacuum seal, it'll last forever, and it is just the way to go because there's a problem with freezer burn. When we did it ourselves, the first thing we did was use the paper wrap because that's what we were taught, and it was available, and it wasn't very expensive, and you didn't need anything. You just wrap it as you go. And it depends on how quickly you're going to utilize it. Um, when you when you do the vacuum pack, boy, uh, we we got a uh, we got a was it Cabela's Cabela's had, we did the little uh, meat saver thing and it wasn't very good and it wouldn't work and it would wear out before we were done. And then we went to Cabela's and they have like this lifetime guarantee on Cabela's and it was a 15 inch model. And a 15 inch will get about, you can get a good leg of lamb. If you're, you're home processing, you want that 15 inch one and you just get the the roll of uh, of the plastic that goes with it because you can seal it on one side and cut it to length, whatever size you want. And uh, that works really well. And you can, you can write, you ought to write down, you know, what it is and when it was uh, processed if you're doing your home use. And that can be purchased at Cabela's Outdoor Stores? Yeah, yeah, they they have a huge hunting section. So there's deer hunters and fishermen that use those uh, vacuum packers, and and they've got them on sale. Sometimes you can get a really good deal. Well, I'm going to have to check into that because we're we I sell probably up to about ten, eleven lambs a year off the flock, and the rest go to the auction sale. But uh, I've had people question me i can you not get it uh shrink wrap and uh, a local laboratory he's they're not equipped to do that and he's not interested in doing that he just assumed to do it in paper yeah that's gonna hurt you i mean uh if you can find another one that maybe is a, a little farther out um uh, just kind of research it uh, because that's really the way to go now i did get with the first guy that did it he did the paper and he said well it costs so much for those vacuum bags and i thought well man let me just buy you some bags you know um because it's uh it's just a much better way it looks better they can see what they're getting because what are you gonna do unwrap it every time someone wants to have a look at it and look at how this exactly. meat is displayed they can see it it's and and the the rack when it's Frenched like this one is, boy, that just makes it worth more. And then people know what that is, and it reminds them of the crown roast, and uh, you can you can get a good price for it. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'll let you go on now. we got a few other questions on meat, but we'll come back to them at the end here. So I know you got okay. some other stuff to cover. All right, fences. So this right here on the right was <laughs> – when we came to this new farm, we moved from 20 acres to 180 acres, and there was just some guys with cattle out there. And I guess their cows didn't test the fence too much because they had like, here's a, a piece of chain looped around a, some welded wire and posts every different distance apart. Um, this fence here is, is what you want. We, at, at our last farm, we did five foot centers, and I think uh, this one is now eight to 10 foot centers, but I've seen some fences uh, when we were looking at 
more land. They had them not exactly spaced in any kind of just randomly and maybe 20 foot and everything else, but you want a good tight fence because if you're going to spend what it's going to take to put a fence in the ground, make it right. Spend a little extra and get good posts, get good supports, get good wire, pull it tight where it'll last you a long time because it, it costs just as much to put a bunch of junk up as it does to put something nice. You want a good straight line. It just, it just looks better and you want to pull a string and you can use a post driver. These uh, welded wire panels, they actually come in uh, horse panels now that are two by fours and the combination panels are smaller at the bottom and bigger at the top. You can even, I put this chart here, you can even take these welded wire, they're 16 foot long and you can uh, brace them at one end and bend them and then put uh, a tarp over them and make your own shed out of that. And you may want to uh, put pallets to kind of weight it down. There's all kinds of ingenious fencing that people can do. Um, the the netting uh, is really good as, as a, not a perimeter fence, but as a cross fencing, because you can move it around, maybe get two of them and, and move around. But you need to teach the animals, if they're not used to electric fence, you need to teach them what it is and not just put little baby lambs out there and let them experiment with it, because it's uh, they, they've got to be trained to it before you throw them out there. This is one of our catch pens. You really want to get a catch pen. It just makes life so much easier. So you can get them in a smaller area so you can uh, do any kind of uh, look at them, do their feet, catch them up, and uh, do body condition scores. These were um, little gates that my husband, he's a welder and an engineer, and he made these gates that he could just tie in so we could make a series of gates all over the place where we could have little uh, turnouts. And our last farm, I think we must have had, we had 20 acres and that counted, uh, here's the, the building, here's our uh, walk-in cooler and freezer and then our cheese room and our our milk room and then the parlor and then of course we had horses, uh, so we had an indoor arena that we'd ride in, we also did our 4-H show in there, so we had every kind of animal on 20 acres and there was probably a hundred of them and we had to feed a lot of hay. So if you overstock and everybody does and you don't have enough grass, then, you know, you just supplement. So you use different types of hay, whatever's available in your area. So if you get too many, you can sell down or just feed them. So that's, that's really how it works. Um, so Debbie, somebody asked what you mean by a catch pen. You want to explain so that? a catch pen means you want a smaller. So if you have a, a little paddock or pasture where the animals are out there grazing, that's where they live. You want to try to get them into a smaller area because sheep and goats are funny about um, becoming feral for no apparent reason. And when you want to catch them, and usually they know when you're trying to catch them. And so you want them in a smaller area so you can corner them because it's a whole lot easier catching them in this little area. You can put a, a panel like this panel across here and then move it in so you have them in really tight little areas so that you can put your hands on them and do whatever you want to. If you if you raise meat animals, oftentimes you don't handle them very much. And different breeds of sheep and goats are more docile than others. Just just think about dogs. You know, you got a Chihuahua and you got a Great Dane. Who's going to stand there longer, right? So some of them are going to be a little more hyper and some of them are going to be more calm and gentle. The, the East Freezes we have are just as laid back, but they're handled all the time. Oftentimes they start as bottle babies, so they're going to just about sit in your lap where um, some of the other animals that aren't handled as much are going to be a lot harder to, to fool with. So a catch pen is just a smaller area, a little tight chute. Sometimes it's a narrow chute with a guillotine uh, front and back to hold them in there where you can uh, just do whatever you need to do to them as far as uh, trying to do their feed or, or uh, do health checks and that kind of thing. Now this is fun. So if, if you have sheep or goats and you have a border collie, that is one employee that loves his job, helps you. You don't hardly need a catch pen because he'll circle them up and bring them right to you. Um, and he's always wanting to go to work and he never gets tired. So um, we would love our border collie and he is just a, a big asset to the farm. These dogs, um, this is Bailey and her cutesy pups, and besides being adorable, they actually have a purpose. A livestock guardian dog is not a guard dog like people think about that's chained up somewhere and barks all the time. These animals, these dogs stay with their uh, ruminants and they, they bond, they imprint, and they would actually just give their lives protecting them. They just, just love them and 
I remember one time, it's, it's, just a, it's just by design. It's just the neatest thing you ever saw. We had a lamb that was stuck in a, in a bunch of briars or thorns. And uh, we had two dogs and, and one got on one side of the lamb and one got on the other side. And they took their teeth and pulled the briars off the lamb and freed the lamb. Because lamb would have stayed there and died. And uh, I just thought it was so amazing because that's just, that's just by design. That is just... Uh, the coolest uh, thing you, you can't teach them that they just have it internally in them and she's a, a part great pyrenees and part anatolian and you'll see that cross pretty often there is a lot of uh you can google it there's a lot of livestock guardian dogs they stay in the pasture they don't come in the house they stay out in the pasture they stay with their small ruminants and they guard them and uh we have one uh big old dog named baxter and uh he sees anything go overhead and in our old location we we're close to the airport and he was just so happy because he never had one of those planes flying over ever land in his pasture because he made sure it just kept on going so they didn't let birds uh, fly over uh, here in the we're in the country now with 180 acres and we had a big problem with uh with buzzards coming around when the lambs were being born and those dogs they just ran them off they wouldn't even let them come close so it is an amazing asset to have those uh those livestock guardian dogs and it depends once again on, on where you are do you have a bunch of coyotes you know is there other uh animals that could uh, affect your flock uh, so it's it's a it's pretty neat to keep them there all right sheds you can go to sam's club and buy this for a thousand dollars and i've seen uh goats in little igloos and uh dog the plastic dog houses and stuff you just gotta make sure you've got them anchored down uh, here's one of the cradles that holds round bales of hay, and they'll seek shade. Uh, here's a couple of goats harassing one of the sheep, but they, they can live together. It's not a problem. This is a deluxe shed that my husband actually built. It's great to have an engineer. Our sheds, this is a shed, and it's made on skids so we can move it around because wherever the animals go in there, especially if it's raining a lot, it gets nasty and muddy, so we put everything on skids, including these these uh, smaller sheds to move them around uh, to cleaner locations. These sheds, we started out making them small enough to hold the goats kind of half the size and not as tall. And the goats like to jump on top of them. So just make sure you have it well supported. But um, we found that when we had taller animals, when the moms were in there trying to nurse, they'd want to stay, uh, especially if the goats didn't like to be rained on, they'd want to stand up, of course, to let the babies nurse, and they wouldn't do it if the sheds were too short. So depending on what kind of animal you have, you might want to make it tall enough where they can stand up in there and let the babies nurse. This is an old barn. Uh, a lot of people that have land have some kind of old barn and you can use that and use the stalls or use a lean-to there's a lot of things but you want to have shelter uh, goats don't like to be rained on and if you have bad weather you want to have a place you can get them in out of the, out of the weather this pasture shot i wanted to show you because there's a, a type of farming called silvo farming and the idea is you have trees and then you have pasture and you have trees and you have pasture especially if you have a farm that has a lot of forest um, You've seen the kudzu plants maybe that, that grow up and vines grow up on trees and just about kill the trees. Well, if you're trying to grow timber, you don't want those things tearing up your, your could be uh, profit. And one thing about goats, they love browse and browse is anything that's up high. So you can see right here, they've eaten the low hanging leaves and they would take care of any cuds or vines that might be affecting uh, your forest. Then they'd stay under there and stay cool during the heat of the day and drop manure. So that would fertilize these plants. It would keep the debris out so that the, the timber can grow. And then they'd go out to the pasture during the evening or the morning hours to graze. So uh, natural shelter is, I think, just as good, maybe even healthier than the sheds. I, uh, we were trying to put in fences and pastures and stuff, and I had a bulldozer guy, he wanted to plow every tree, and I was like, that is food. Now, sheep tend to graze more on the pasture, about 60% and 40% browse, where goats want to do the browse, which would be 60%, and then the pasture, 40%. But I have found that maybe it's an individual thing, because I've seen some sheep, they're climbing up the trees eating, and then some goats over here grazing. So I think sometimes it's an individual. These are uh, Nigerian goats, by the way. And this is one of the East Grecian lambs. And I'm going to go into some breeds in a, in a little bit. I just had to do this photo because when you're going in with a bucket of feed, sometimes it feels like this. It feels like they're coming to get you and you're like, stand back. 
And because of that, if you're going to use just um, tubs, I recommend this one because it doesn't spill. The average one just comes up straight, and if they step in it, they're going to flip it over and dump it every time. Or this one, the feet will be in there. The other thing I like about this is it's hard plastic, so you can sterilize it better, where the rubber ones tend to hold things in there, maybe bacteria and stuff. And that's just my personal thing. That's just what I like. So you can take that or leave it. I also like the flat back buckets because you could put them up against a fence or a wall and it just keeps them from turning over. And remember when you have handles, if you leave it upright like this and your sheep or your goat goes in there to drink and they lift their head up, they're going to be running around with a necklace that they're not going to enjoy. And so always put the handles down or you can clip them to a fence or a post or whatever when you're uh, feeding out in the pasture. These are some uh, feed troughs that my husband made and they're over the fence feeders. You can lift up the lid and drop the feed and it kind of funnels and spreads. He's even got a little, a little uh, creep feeder kind of thing where they can keep separate. And there's one pair to the fence, parallel to the fence and one that feeds on both sides. So you can come up with all kinds of things. These also are in skids. So you can drag them around and move them to different areas. They probably don't move as much as uh, sheds, but um, it is something if you're, if you're, Going to rotate your pastures and use different pastures you want to be able to move those things around and we made them where you could take a, a riding mower and pull them around so um, water troughs this is an automatic water that's not hooked up i i don't always go for the automatic water because sometimes it'll it'll leak and or the hose will bust and you'll have water everywhere the other thing is you won't know if your animals are drinking and goats in particular like uh clean water and um we usually put like apple cider vinegar in the water. That does a couple of things. It's good for cleaning out the urinary tract. So or when we talk about feed, uh, you have to worry about urinary calculi. That just helps that. It also helps from the, the green stuff growing in the trough. Uh, it's good for inflammation. So it's just a great, uh, it, just, it just is a really good additive using the apple cider vinegar. Electrolytes in the summer, if it's gonna be 90 degrees, it's just like you're drinking Gatorade or you need something salty, um, they're the same way. And then uh, these are some bulk feeders. You can get them at just about any feed store. And yes, the goats are always jumping in them and the sheep are just disgusted about the whole thing. But um, these things you can drag, you can pick them up and carry them. They don't hardly weigh anything. This is also a catch pen. So while they're in there eating, uh, we can uh, have a closer look at them if we need to. Uh, minerals, uh, the difference between sheep and goats is copper can be toxic to sheep and Goats need a lot of copper in their minerals. So what I do if I'm keeping sheep and goats together, I'll put the minerals that are good for goats that have a high copper content up high because the sheep are rarely jump on top of things and goats are always on top of things. I think you can see here, they're on top of these sheds or in here. So we just put things up where the, I know that the sheep won't get to them. And they all need just the white salt and Used to, you'd put a salt block, and the thing about salt blocks is if it rains on them, it doesn't ruin them, but the loose minerals, they can get more of what they need, so if it's a salt block, they have to lick the amount that they need, and they just can't get enough, and so the loose minerals are, are really the best way to go. Now, if it gets rained on, then it's you just about throw it away, so you might as well put it in a shed or uh, have the type of uh, mineral holders that have a, a little roof on it, and um, that way you can make sure they're getting what they need. Debbie, a couple of people asked on the apple cider vinegar on how much you put in the water. Um, so how do you what we, that? yeah, we, so what we typically do is um, for these smaller troughs, these are like 35 gallon troughs, but if you, if you're only filling them up halfway because, you know, the dog gets in them or they poop in them or something, you know, then you're going to do it. But if, if you're filling it up about halfway, you can put about two teaspoons in there and that'll be enough. If you have like a, a horse-sized water trough, it's going to be about a quarter of a cup. And the electrolytes they usually have, I, I think I have electrolytes. Uh, yeah, there's uh, it's on the next slide. So there's electrolytes like Landolite, Mekelon, especially for ruminants. Electrolytes really aren't so much species specific because it's they're not going to put copper in there. So it's just about good for anyone you could get whatever works. There are some of these electrolytes that are, have some stuff specifically for ruminants, for, um, for the rumen, but uh, most of it is, um, is any breed. So you can use it for any of the animals you want to. And 
uh, you can get any apple cider vinegar you want. They would tell you, and I think it's true that if it has with the mother, that it's a little better. And usually you want to shake it up before you use it. Um, this is a lamb bar. So if we have bottle babies, and you can see my sheep and my goats are, are uh, all sucking on the lamb bar together. Um, we like the Land O'Lakes uh, milk replacer. We've done real good with that. I know Tractor Supply has some. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's, there's more than one type, but you want it where it mixes well, and that's, uh, and, and most of it's uh, species specific. So there's a lamb milk replacer and there's a goat milk replacer. Sometimes we're doing a, a mix of uh, goat milk and sheep milk if we had it, and it, the sheep need more of the protein that's in the sheep and lamb milk replacer, and the goats don't. So the goats are going to nurse a lot longer than the than the sheep. So the sheep are going to the lambs are going to grow really rapidly. So, um, and I'll tell you as far as feed goes, uh, these. Uh, a lot of producers are just going to do whole corn, and uh, if if you're going to get sheep or goats, I would try to, if you're going to keep sheep and goats together, you can get an all-breed feed, and if you're going to start with just two or three, just go to the feed store and see what they have. If they have an all-breed thing, follow the directions on the bag, but I think you need to think about the need because there's a, a lot of people just want to do grass-fed, and that's I think that's fine for some animals, but the need is what's going to determine what the feed requirements are. And this is the way to think about it. If you have uh, a ewe that has triplets, her need is going to be a lot greater than a ewe that's pregnant or one that doesn't have a baby or one that even has a, a single. And if you expect her to forage to be able to feed triplets, uh, she can't get enough calories in from forage to, to be able to support the babies. So um, just use some use some common sense and wisdom with that, and uh, try to get some some help on knowing what you need to feed them. But I think that the the need is is going to make a big difference. We've got uh, the tunas or the meat sheep, and they can just like look at grain and stay fat. And but they're putting all their energy into just putting more pounds on. And when they reach a certain size, they don't need that. Just a little maintenance diet be fine. And some of them do absolutely fine on just grass, even raising a lamb. But there's some that if they're gonna give you a gallon a day, it's gonna be really hard for them to do it just on a little bit of grass. So, and a lot of people that say grass fed, they're using like alfalfa uh, fields and other things. They're using legumes and, and uh, they've got high proteins uh, in their, and they have uh, other supplements that, that really help those animals to survive. So uh, just, just a word of advice on that. You can, uh, you can certainly research a lot on your own on, on things that you can do to feed them. And I will tell you that all bags of feed have on the bag, this is a complete feed, don't add anything else to it. And I want to tell you, almost everyone I know adds something else to it, and that's just the way it is. And you can decide, we, we have our own mixture now. We have a custom feed made at a feed mill. And we have so many of them that it's easier for us to buy in bulk and it's less expensive. And that's one of the economies of scale, you get to a certain size and you buy bulk and instead of paying $16 a bag, it's more like five, six or $7 a bag, depending on what you get, if it was a 50 pound bag. And, um, but you, you, you have to have the facilities to be able to do that, or you have to have the volume because feed goes bad. So you can't get this huge amount to save a little money because then it's going to go bad before you ever use it. So you can't always uh, do it that way. Okay. All right. Kim, you have in? time for one question. Uh, Kim, sure. Kim Wright, you I'm going to go ahead and unmute oh, you. Yes. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, I just wanted to know, Debbie, did you homeschool? <laughs> no. Did but you I'll not? tell you, we, we, but farming is homeschool. You it know? is. It is, and it's it's excellent. And, and we did, uh, our 4-H club had 90 members, and almost, gosh, 80% were homeschoolers. And everything we do is a class. Everything we do is science. Everything we do is math. Everything has a purpose. And, uh, and it's just, it's just, um, it, it's a great learning experience. And I think it's so good for the kids. Was that your actual question? That really was. We, I mean, we dissected everything we could get our hands on. And uh, if we found a rabbit that had just been hit by a car, we would dissect it. I wrote yeah. articles for the magazines about it. But very much, you're right, the farming is homeschool centric. Yeah. The home. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. 
All right, I had to talk a little bit about goats. Um, so here's a lamb that would sit in his lap for the rest of the day. We drove into the pasture and these girls, if you look closely, she has the keys to this vehicle in her mouth. And these are, are uh, not sheep, these are goats. And that's just how they are. And um, we, these are sawn and goats and you can see they're great milkers. Um, a lot of people like the Nubians because of the floppy ears. It's like Zsa, Zsa Binks going through there. These are the Nigerian dwarfs. And I just want to show you that a lot of people start with Nigerian dwarfs because they're small. But uh, here's one of our old milking stands. And there's actually a Nigerian dwarf in there. And that's why we don't milk the Nigerian dwarfs anymore. Because first of all, they're so little. Um, they get squished out of there. And, and if you have a mixture, it, it's hard because they have a different nutritional need than this girl. So. Um, that's the difference. And then here's a little Tunis lamb. And here's the shearer because one thing, when you have sheep and you have hair, a wool sheep, you have to shear them. Um, we've had hair sheep. I, I didn't uh, like them for milking. And um, I thought it was amazing that the little tiny bit of milk they had actually supported the lambs, but they do well. And I think they're good moms. I just, I don't like all the debris when they shed. It's just everywhere and they just don't look as good, but that's just my personal preference. Everybody needs to do what they, they like the best. So we went from that stand that you saw on the last slide. Uh, and actually, we were limited in space. And so we were doing two stands and then we're trying to get three stands. And it's just we we grew faster than we we could. And this was actually a hydraulic lift because we didn't have room for ramps. And goats can jump pretty good, but sheep are just not ballerinas. They don't need to be jumping too much, especially with big bags of milk. And so that had a hydraulic lift that was pretty cool, but we can only do eight at a time. And so we've got our new barn that we built at the new place. And there's a feed trough here. And a lot of places will just take that feed trough and they'll have feed somewhere else and bring in five gallon buckets to fill it up. And we thought, well, we're trying to do stuff to save labor. So we've got a feed bin that pumps it in and it automatically fills the, uh, the feeder. So we just press a button, the feed drops to the, the troughs and then it lowers it down and then the animals come in. And this is before the railings were set up. That's my wonderful husband, Alan. And the sheep go in there and then this whole thing lifts up and they walk around and they go out the other door. And Alan made these guillotine doors. And uh, this is our, our cheese room and our milk room. And it's just beautiful and there's so much room. We're gonna have giant, huge uh, classes in there. It'll be great. And then this is our store. It's just one section of the store. We're actually dealers for Coburn now. So we're selling these uh, these items and we're also selling a really neat uh, milker that uh, is for home use or you can start. Uh, you can even do uh, licensed uh, dairy with that. Uh, I don't have a picture of it right here, but it's it's pretty neat and I can, I can talk about it some other time. So Debbie, we do have one question. Kimmy, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I've got a question about your um, milk room and your cheese room. Yes. You said you were going to do classes. Um, are you going to be doing that soon? Because that's what we're venturing into. We're um, new with our goats and our dairy sheep. We've got dairy sheep and dairy goats. Yeah. So that's one reason why I was wanting to watch this, you know, be a part of this, is because I'm wanting to find those classes. So when you said that, like, I got really excited, and I'm hoping you're going to do that really soon. <laughs> Yeah, we're in North Carolina, so I'm scared about what I can do and what I can't do. So. Well, uh, I can, I do, sometimes I do like a basic kind of overall, just the science and the math of the cheese making. And, and then, um, then we do like a cheese making 101 and 102 and that kind of thing. So we, we, you know, there's a, a couple, of, but we're planning on doing our classes in September. I, I want to tell you, we moved in January. It rained every day from October till March and, we had a hard time getting the building built and then it was just moving. We've been in the same place for 28 years and I never thought it would be that hard. It was pretty hard moving and we're still trying to catch up, but we're going to try and plan our cheese making classes for September. We're actually going to try and have some, uh, try and do some Airbnb on the property where people could spend a week with us and learn how to milk and learn how to make cheese and help in the cheese room and all kinds of things. So oh, yes, awesome. we're going to do classes. Well, then I'll stay close by to wherever you're at because I want to find out what's going on. <laughs> okay, now where do you live? I'm in Albemarle, North Carolina. Yeah, that's probably not too awful far from us. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You're not at all. We were just down there at a Clemson at a class that they had down there, so no. Yeah. Okay, well, you know exactly for how far we are then. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Kimmy.
Okay, we're probably gonna run out of time, I guess, but um, so just some, you can read the slide. The, you can Google FAMACHA body condition score. I only put BOSS on here because you're gonna see that a lot on Facebook pages. BOSS is just black oil sunflower seeds. And a lot of people will feed that for extra fat and extra um, cream in your milk and that kind of thing. Um, keep things consistent, uh, veterinary care. You wanna make sure that you have a relationship with a vet and you're gonna, you're gonna have some vets now that just wanna do small animals and that happened to us and, and it was heartbreaking. And uh, there's a lot of things that you can do at home. And the best thing you can do is have good practices to keep your animals healthy so you won't need the vet. But things happen and the, the problem is, is, is you're gonna spend more on the vet care than you are on the animal a lot of times. And, we do these talks, We uh, before we moved, we did a, a monthly class on everything all the time. And one thing that the veterinarians would always say during the class is, well, if you have one that's got a problem, just call it. Well, you know, if you got two animals, you know, you got milky one and milky two, and, and one of them has some, uh, she's not very parasite resistant. Well, you, you take her out and you only have one. So calling isn't always an option. It will be an option when you have bunches of them and you're spending all your time on one instead of the other 99. So uh, that's that's where that comes from. So just know that sometimes it's going to be, um, you know, that's going to be part of the issue. And then you want to have a first aid kit and a, a lambing kit. And I think you can probably Google some of that stuff. I think Pipestone and Premier One has uh, some of those things. But the FAMACHA, I cannot talk too much about that. Remember that you've got internal parasites and external parasites. So um, I think uh, we can come back to that if there's a question. These are some of the top beginner mistakes. Feeding too much grain. Um, I've had two calls in, a, in the last 30 days about people that fed their animals too much and, and got urinary calculi, and that will just plum kill them. And it's like a, the worst kidney stones ever. And it's generally from too much grain. And there's things you can do to prevent it. And the main thing is only feed on the need, not just uh, everybody wants to make their animals fat, and that's not always good enough. And, you know, if you have them standing out in the pasture and you don't know anything about them, you know, if you don't have enough hands on, you're not going to know. We already talked about minerals. And then for dairy animals, people that don't milk them out enough, the animals dry up. And it's a, it's a need thing. If you never milk them out all the way, they're going to start to create less and less and less until they finally dry up. And then for your transitions, you can fill on the hoof. And we already talked about some of this with that. And then when you're starting out with dairy and cheese making, you do home use and bartering and, and uh, even for pet use. Uh, check your your state laws for licensing. Um, you're gonna the more you grow, the better you're gonna do. And, and I can just uh, you saw how we were milking with a smaller and, and larger. The cheese making. Let me explain it this way: If you're gonna make hard cheese, and most of these little recipes you can find online are for two gallons of milk, and it might take you six hours to make that. Well, right now we're I remember I saw some notes somewhere that most I thought I'd ever need is a 15 gallon vat. You know, we're doing 100 now. And uh, if I can make uh, 100 pounds of cheese in the same amount of time as it would take me to make two gallons, because there's a process in cheese making, so it will take you so many hours to do certain things. Well, the economy of scale just really kicks in. We bought a Hobart mixer, we make some soft cheeses that has uh, different herbs in it and different mixtures. And I'd have to be, I had a KitchenAid, the biggest one I could get was like three quarts and it would take me all day to mix my cheese. And then I'd have to package it. Now I mix everything, I can, I can mix 65 pounds of cheese in an hour and have it packaged, I'm done for the day. So economy scale is great, but you wouldn't need a $1,200 Hobart uh, to mix your cheese. You'd be fine with a bowl initially starting off. So, and the more you grow, the more experience and knowledge you're gonna get. So I think that, uh, it all comes uh, with time. And, and I think that the growing pains, um, when we first did a licensed cheese room, we ended up, um, I, could, I didn't know how to do it because I'd done it in my kitchen for so many years. Uh, it took me some time using all the extra room. And now, you know, no one ever says they built something too big. You always find room and uh, you can use all that stuff and, and use more. Um, we've got a handout and these are just some resources that, um, that we like and uh, you've got a handout and it'll help you get there. There's just be careful on some of the social media sites because a lot of times people are telling you stuff and they, that was just their experience with one or two goats and sheep or whatever and, and maybe it's incorrect and so be careful with that. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you, Debbie. And um, 
there is a, as Debbie mentioned, there is a handout that you can pull off of your um, control panel there that we made available to you with some of the URLs for these links that she has there. I also sent out the link for the uh, Let's Grow resources page, and I sent that out because on there, the very first thing on the list is a sheep education catalog. It's gotten a little dated now. It's about six years old, but my wife and I put that together, and when uh, I saw the State University Extension offices on Debbie's list, I thought we better make that available because there's a whole chapter there on just the State University Extension office websites. Um, so with that, I know we're pretty much out of time, but we did have a few good questions come in that I wonder if you wouldn't mind entertaining. Sure. Um, one of them was on the guard dogs. Uh, you mentioned the importance of having a good do guard dog, but you also mentioned that you used to live in a 20 acre farm surrounded by houses. And of course, guard dogs yeah. and close neighbors are not always a good mix. Uh, yeah. Any suggestions there on breeded dogs that are good in those types of environments or any recommendations for folks? Well, uh, you may not need a livestock guardian dog if you're surrounded by neighbors, uh, unless your neighbor's dogs might be the problem. We, uh, when, as, as we ended up having pups and things and, and neighbors all had dogs and they, their, our fence was their fence and, and uh, uh, they'd have little yappy dogs barking through the fence, aggravating our dogs. And, and uh, we ended up just to be good neighbors, we had to put like a barking collar on our dog so that their dog could bark and ours wouldn't. <laughs> and I, I was really frustrated by that. I'm just happy that we're further out and our dogs can do their job without, you know, bothering anybody. But um, some of the livestock guardian dogs have barking problems and that's a problem for neighbors. Um, but it's it's a, also a good thing because it keeps all predators out. So um, that's the thing. I mean, you have to maybe make adjustments that you don't really want to do. and. Um, because that dog's protecting. If there's another dog in the side of the fence, it wants to bark and make them get away from its its uh, ruminants to protect them. So that is an issue. But we did have to use a barking collar, and I didn't like it, but we didn't know what else to do. Okay, we had a question come in also about breeds of sheep, in particular uh, working with children. You uh, started off with a lot of slides working uh, mm -hmm. with children of various sorts, but somebody's basically asking, is there a particular breed of sheep you recommend for use as therapy pets, or maybe equivalent, maybe some you don't recommend as therapy pets? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know this has been my personal experience, so I, you know, I don't want to get anybody mad at me, you know, disrespecting other breeds, but we found that the, the hair sheep were were not as gentle and easy to work with. They were a little more timid and a little wilder. But that being said, we had a lot of bottle baby lambs that were the absolute best. And most lambs, if they're used to people, they would just sit in your lap all day long. And I had, we've got, you can look at my Facebook page and we've got kids in wheelchairs and kids that uh, couldn't walk very well. And, and they all loved seeing the lambs. And it was just a beautiful thing. And, and the sensory input from the wool and uh, just the softness and the, the cuddly thing with the lambs, it was pretty amazing. And um, the kids liked it. Then the lambs are a lot quieter and gentler than uh, sometimes the goats. You can hold them for a minute and then they start to get squirming and want to jump and they want to jump on you and chew on your hair and your clothes and stuff where the, the lambs don't don't do that very often, hardly ever. So um, I think we, we like our East Frisian uh, dairy sheep. We've, we've sold a lot of our dairy sheep to people starting off and they have just been the best, uh, the best little lambs and the best little grown ups. We've got pictures of our sheep. You scratch them at a certain place and they wag their tail and the kids think that's the greatest thing. And then our, our, uh, our tuna sheep are very kind and very gentle. So, um, but I think anything that's handled a lot or if you can get a bottle baby, that's the way to go with it. Okay, and then I mentioned that we had some people ask questions on the meat uh, side of things, and, and there's a lot of different ones, but I'll pick some of the best worded ones here. One of them was basically uh, selling whole carcasses versus selling cuts, um, and then, uh, you know, do you make more money on cuts? Do you make more money just selling carcasses and not have to pay for the processing? When do you pay for the processing? That decision there is, is a quandary for some people. Well, we found it depends on who you're selling to, because if you're selling to chefs, they want the whole carcass and it costs you less and it's easier to do. Um, but most of these processors are going to charge what they call a kill fee. And then uh, there's some of them that 
it, it depends. Every processor is different, it seems to me. And sometimes they'll charge you so much per pound, regardless of the cut you get. So you might as well make them do a really good detailed job and be able to sell it for more. Because if you're selling a whole carcass, maybe the person's only going to give you seven or eight dollars a pound uh, carcass weight. Where if you make uh, your rack and your loin chops that you can sell for $22 a pound and then grind a bunch for $15 a pound. I mean, that's the price that we're getting and nobody's balking at it. So I, I think for us, it's been pretty, pretty valuable. We, we've only just really started selling these higher cuts in the last year. I will mention, put in a plug for the American Land Board, they so want people to make these more expensive cuts to get more people to taste American lamb that they actually paid for my processing fees last year, every bit of them. And so, of course, it was great making the sausage and getting these different uh, cuts. And uh, American Lamb Board is dedicated to help more people eat lamb. And if they have to help processors, process, you know, or help producers pay some process fees, I think there's a lot of uh, grants out there that you may not be aware of. For the USDA, they have a value added grant that we actually received. And it's for that sort of thing. So the value added is you have your meat, but then the value added is making a different cuts, so whether it's the, the processing fees or the packaging or whatever it is, they'll help pay for that sort of thing and, and for advertising. And that way you can you can have a, a, a good step up to, to be able to do things. So you mentioned the farmer's market. Does that also apply to the farmer's market? And, uh, you know, how much of a how much is that worth it, given the labor needs of having somebody there manning a farmer's market booth? Well, for us, um, this this past year, we we went to the biggest market in our area is the downtown Greenville Market, and they have 15,000 people that come every Saturday, and it's from 8 to 12, and when we lived 15 minutes away, it was a little less of a burden than now we live 50 minutes away, and uh, so it's a, almost an hour drive, but um, with selling the meat and the cheese, I made $1,000 one Saturday, and I was okay with coming in extra early and spending from 8 to 12 there at the market, and it was well worth it. And on the slow times, uh, we're getting $300, so uh, the average has been about five, five fifty, and I feel pretty good about that. So I think it's that's a pretty good paycheck for a Saturday morning, and you can decide how many times you want to come in. I think the, I think they charge like $30 per Saturday, but... If you pay in advance, it's more like 20 bucks. And um, so that's that's what works. And we're also uh, selling our meat in grocery stores and, and things like that. Now, we had to get big enough to do that because before when we'd sell them on the hoof or we'd sell a whole carcass, you know, we had like, you know, we're yielding two or three lambs or if we're doing 10 lambs or something like that, you know, then, you know, it's hard to, because we didn't have enough to be able to supply someone for the whole season. In fact, we're doing so well with this meat. I think we're, uh, we may sell out before the before the season's over, and that's a good problem to have. And that's why we got more acreage so we could grow more lambs so that we could sell more because it's been – and if we have more pasture, we don't have to do so much hay. We can do pasture, and that cuts out a lot of expense. Yeah, and some people were asking that very question in terms of the size of your herd, you know, and this transition from just having a few for your home use and then actually selling something direct in particular. It's, it's easy to grow uh, sheep and, and goats, uh, mostly sheep, because you're getting a better better premium. I think uh, more people would eat lamb. Well, it depends on who you are and where you're talking from, but we're, we're selling more lamb uh, because people are more aware of it and then, than goat meat. And um, I think that uh, I didn't mention the prices of the of the milk, but goat's milk in our area typically sells for $14 a gallon. But for my sheep milk, I'm getting $28 a gallon. And I have, uh, there's a pharmacist that gets my sheep milk for his kids that have immune disorders. And they were in the lower percentiles and they couldn't keep things down. And when they started on the sheep milk, not only did they enjoy it better, they slept through the night and then they got in their their uh, better uh, percentiles. And that we actually had older people drinking it for to help them settle, it satisfies them and relaxes them. Kind of like after a turkey dinner or Thanksgiving, you, you have that feeling of relaxing. The sheep milk does the same thing. And the sheep milk is, is easy to digest as the goat's milk, but it has three times the protein and has a sweet, rich taste. So 
we sell our yogurt for ten dollars a quart so that's still like turning it into forty dollars a gallon so a lot of people don't realize sheet milk is is up and coming there's just not that many people doing sheet milk and a lot of people aren't aware of it and that's why we're trying to help more people get into the sheep milk uh, because if they can get into dairy sheep then more people will know about it and realize how what a good product it is and then you can still raise lamb even if you're raising dairy sheep you'll still be raising lamb and we've done that we had 115 lambs this past uh, this past season even with the move and all which was kind of hard but um, it's uh, you can get a return on your investment with uh, whatever you're putting into your your dairy sheep and your lambs uh, with your return on your investment Okay, thank thank you, Debbie, and that was an interesting presentation, especially all the great pictures that you shared with us. And, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our audience. Uh, a lot of great questions came in during it, and uh, and there at the end, and and uh, it was really a lot of fun to do this because we're used to you know doing health ones or or uh, more general topics, and this was uh, something that's been on the to do list for a while, and it's nice to finally get one in on how to start a small farm with your sheep and, and or goats and uh, and make it work. So really appreciate it. Well, and my email's on there. If somebody had some questions they didn't get answered, I'd be happy to, you know, they can email me. And if they had other questions, it'd be fine. Okay. And this is recorded. So you all get a follow-up email uh, in the next 48 hours. It has a link to the recording and also a link to Debbie's slides. Uh, once again, there's a handout on here that you can download uh, before you leave. It has URLs for all of these uh uh, resources that Debbie has on this slide here listed and then I also provided the URL for the sheep uh, USA.org let's grow resources uh, website which has the uh, history of the recordings are on there under educational webinars and then also that sheep education catalog is there at the top of the list and during the webinar when we were talking about the sheep skins and stuff I also shared a URL for Nugget International I'm not sure how much mm -hmm. uh, they do of custom stuff for skins, but that came up on how to, where to get them processed, and uh, and I know that they have a, a facility down in in San Antonio, Texas, that they do some processing with. So um, anyway, so I think that'll wrap it up this evening. I thank everybody for joining us, and I thank you, Debbie, for a great presentation. And I want to thank uh, the American Sheep Industry and the Let's Grow Committee for uh, providing the funding for these webinars. We'll have another webinar in uh, September. It'll be a little bit more uh, Western uh, webinar. We'll be looking at uh, basically uh, uh, ram uh, productivity on a flock out here out west that's uh, part of a Let's Grow project where they're basically uh, tracking uh, uh, ram breeding uh, productivity in, in a large western flock. So I'm sure that'll be interesting. Uh, um, as we uh, get that set up, uh, I'll get those emails out to you and uh, invite all of you to to join us. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and thank thank everybody for being here and wish everybody a, a pleasant evening.